my name is Richard Green. I'm director of the USC Lusk Center for Real Estate. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what I believe is the 22nd installment of Lusk Perspectives. Uh, we have a particularly timely talk today. Um, it involves housing and I think it's fair to say one of the pleasant surprises of the last four months or so is that housing has not done as badly as a lot of us thought it was going to do. Um, and to shed a lot of light on that, we have a particularly appropriate person, Bird Anderson. Uh, Bird runs uh, Home Builder Lending for Wells Fargo, and he's coming to us today from Charlotte. Um, Bird is, I think, someone who you would call a lifer. He has been, I looked it up, at Wells Fargo for 35 years. Um, I guess what I could say is I've been married for 35 years, so um, and that's gone very quickly. So I, I imagine it's gone quickly for you too. Sounds like it's been a good professional marriage. Um, and I, I've gotten to see his slides in advance. They're, they're really on target for the sorts of things that I know I'm worrying about right now. And I think that will be true for all of you. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Bert Anderson, thank you for being here and please take it away. Well, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, it's delightful to be here. Um, we've shared probably a stage or two uh, at a ULI meeting or a home builder industry event of some sort, but it's a treat to be your guest as a, um, as a virtual uh, uh, colleague or partner. And uh, uh, Scott Laurie from the Olson Company, uh, curse his name or, or God bless him, whichever it tends to be. He, I think, uh, nominated me for this. We've had a good relationship with that company for many, many years. Um, and I also want to note Amanda Thompson is with us today. She's a young banking colleague of mine here in Charlotte who helps me uh, with a lot of special projects like this. In addition to being a really sound banker and relationship manager uh, in, in her day job. So uh, I, will, I will get after uh, what I've got uh, and then we'll, we'll save plenty of time um, to, uh, to get any questions you have or, or your, your guests uh, that are part of the, the uh, perspectives um, team there. Uh, so what you and I talked, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago, and uh, we sort of came up with this agenda, which was what has happened, what looking backwards, uh, what were the builders doing then and what are they doing now? Uh, why do we think housing has in fact I wouldn't say survived, I would say thrived. I would have said survived in late April into early May, but since since early to mid-May, I wouldn't say survived, I would say thrived. Uh, we'll get some commentary from, from builders in our portfolio. I'll give you a perspective of what banks are doing from one bank's perspective, not, not from a, uh, a survey of other bankers or anything like that, but just a sense of what we see in the market and what we're doing. And then take a shot at what we think of, of in terms of what banks are doing the same or differently and what builders are, are doing the same or differently. What do we think is sort of temporary? What's, what's probably going to stick around a while? And like I said, we'll do that in quick enough time that if there are any questions, we should have plenty of time for that. Um, I wouldn't know if just before I jump into it, um, I know you've had economists, I know you've had John Burns, I know you've had statisticians and policy professionals. The, the perspectives I'm gonna share with you today are going to be, while there is some survey material, it is much more trend, theme, commentary uh, versus a statistically correct survey that was emailed monthly or weekly out and, and compiled and, and scraped and scrapped from a statistical perspective in the manner an economist would or a statistician would do. And uh, these, these again, would be more observation oriented, but we do have some, some data as well. Um, just as a brief shot of what we do, we have a home builder banking group within the commercial real estate at Wells Fargo. It's, it's our purpose to uh, lend money, but in addition to lending money to, to add value as a lender, uh, by having a real understanding of the industry and proper structuring and advantageous structuring for any given deal or profile of a customer. And then to really um, interact closely with our um, partners all over the banks to make sure we're bringing the appropriate 
insights or products or whatever to anybody. So that's what we do. That's that's who we are. Um, it's really a middle market and large builder uh, business. So if you if you look at the Hanley Wood or or professional builder builder 100 or building giants or uh, top 100 or 200, that tends to be our client base. In addition to the large national public companies, um, there are regional private and, and larger companies. Um, I'd say the smallest builder in our portfolio probably does a couple hundred houses a year. And then, you know, DR Horton and Lennar are customers. So we sort of run from 200 to 60,000. Uh, we tried to get a good sample of just some profile names you may recognize with a heavy emphasis on the ones that are based out there uh, in California. Is, is there for a particular reason why the Olson company is the first company you have listed on your slide? I don't know. I think we put that in a random drawing like they do for the uh, NBA draft. I and, see. No, that's, that's, that's a, a hat tip to Scott again for uh, uh, making me your, your guinea pig today. So, um, no, we, we, in all seriousness, we have such a great basket of customers. Uh, and these are, again, there are a few that are California builders that we don't have their permission formally to do this, but so we hadn't put it up there. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a really nice business. The, the builders that are active today were survivors uh, of the Great Recession with a you know 70 or 80 percent drop in volume with a 30 or 40 percent drop in price. And if, if you're an industry or or business that survives that you're you're resilient um, so looking backward what what happened sort of the last several months before we got into June and July I would note um, we came in in such a strong place we came into COVID I had a number of builders say things like the spring sales season started January 1st or December 26 and those kind of things. So backlogs were really, really good coming into uh, into the sort of early to mid March COVID crisis era. Um, it was a booming January, February, um, and then mid March it really just pivoted, and it dropped 20. Depending on where you were, sort of 20 to 40 percent. We were sampling every week then, and it went down 20 to 40 percent every week. So that by mid-April, roughly speaking, our customers were at 20% of their prior year pace, down 80%. Um, so it kind of just just ticked straight down. It didn't drop down, although for a week, that's a pretty big drop, but we did see it week to week. Uh, and then it just sort of made the same pivot right back up uh, starting in mid-April. Um, sort of almost at the same pace, just climbed right back up to then May, uh, which was not as good as June, but it was a very good month. A lot of builders, the majority in our portfolio that we sampled were up year over year in May um, and notably up. Um, the best performing segments and markets seem to be entry level or lower price, first move up, suburban, exurban, smaller markets, tertiary markets, lower prices uh, from a segment sort of profile perspective. Not that larger cities were not performing well, they were, but it was the suburbs and the exurbs of those larger cities. And then the Southeast and Texas uh, through May in particular really seemed to stand out as outperformers. Um, the obvious markets that were underperformers were higher end things, some second home things, uh, some resorty things, uh, active adult, the, the, the older, the older potential buyers were less quick to come back out and travel. Uh, coastal markets, California markets a little slower. And then obviously the shutdown markets, wherever that would have been where for a longer period of time, they said housing is not a protected uh, critical industry and so you can't build. Well, obviously, on Long Island, New York or Seattle, Washington, if you can't build, it was slower to, to turn. So what about June? I, I saw John Burns, who I know you've had as a speaker before, who's a great industry guru, who we respect very, very much, said that um, 
this survey suggested sales were up 55% year over year in June. And I don't know where in the get world he gets that data. That's simply wrong. Uh, the right answer, if you look in the bottom there, is 57%. <laughs> um, I, I was actually gratified to see that number because when I when I when I was making this deck and saying I'm really going to go show uh, in a recorded room full of people that our survey said sales year over year up 57%. Um, that's got to be, I've got to have done something wrong. So uh, I left it in there yesterday when Burns came out with 55. Uh, it was good to see we were aligned. Our survey, just to give a, a perspective that we did in some, uh, some detail uh, at the first week of July, it was 37 builders that represented 40,000, over 40,000 closings last year. So average 11, 1200 so 11 or 1200 units was an average builder. I, I would note as I did at the top of the call, this was not done statistically with the help of our economics department or uh, math and IT guys. It, it was really, we, it's not statistically correct because we're overweighted um, in sort of the Southeast and uh, California and Texas and Mid-Atlantic too. And we're definitely under sampled in um, the Rocky Mountains, Pacific Northwest, um, to lesser extent, Midwest and Northeast. Mid-Atlantic is misplaced there. We actually do have a good representative sample in the, in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, anytime you're dealing with smaller builders, um, you know, they can have big jumps or, or drops because just one or two more or less communities are open. Uh, one year to the next. Uh, this is not a same store sampling. And then builders themselves report net and gross sales differently and drop things or move them to a um, to a cancellation at a different pace and reason. Um, but nevertheless, we think it's directionally a good a good thing to see. So June, 34 out of 37 builders were up year over year. Um, I can't see my graph on the far right side because of our pictures, but uh, those boxes show you the March, April, May, and June. The box is the um, is the 50 percent uh, percentile, and then the line graph is the 75th high low, and then the dots that are way above or way below were, were deemed statistically insignificant um, for that month for some reason or another, so far outside. Um, but anyway, the bottom line is it's thriving as of June. Um, it's not just surviving. And there was a precipitous decline for four or five weeks in a row, mid-March to mid-April, that pivoted back in May that is now, uh, at least for one month, was quite stable in the first two weeks of July appear very strong. Um, all right. so. What, what are the builders telling us in this June survey? Um, clearly, there's a confidence and a comfort and a shift uh, from, uh, uh, it's, it's pivoted, whereas the, the infill, uh, urban, suburban, higher density was where all the action was. It had begun moving a bit, that had lost some cachet as people uh, needed more affordable things and were moving out. That accelerated here over the last four months. Um, there are not many cancellations. There were some for sure that Scott noted a couple of months ago in, in the mid March, mid April, that was offsetting any sales to speak of that has changed. Uh, notable builders, many builders in their comments say the people that are making an appointment online or scheduling a virtual tour and this sort of thing, those that's a real buyer. That's not a tire kicker. Um, more and more renters, particularly those in urban or denser settings, want more space. They want their own place. A number of builders did say there's sort of a paradox created by this. Um, builders really turned off, all the way off their spec starts appropriately back in mid-March, mid-April. Well, now it's mid-late June, early July, and buyers are looking to move in quickly 
and there's not a lot of standing inventory on the ground because of that complete turnoff for a four to six day week period. Um, so they're trying to, to gauge their starts at the right pace now and find the right cadence. Um, we have a good, we have, we're broadly exposed across Texas, including Houston. I don't understand it, but you know, 20 or $25 oil prices is not creating havoc in that market for housing at this point. No, Bert, could I, could I just weigh in on that a little bit? Because Houston has become remarkably diversified over the last 40 years. And so I, I did an analysis a few years back on what happens if the price of oil falls by half to employment in Houston. And what happens is relative to the country, its unemployment rate goes up by about one percentage point. So that's real, but it's not enormous. Whereas if you had done that analysis 40 years ago, that, that kind of decline in oil prices would have been catastrophic. So I'm, I'm not that surprised. Houston is a real economy now. I mean, it, it's better educated city than the average American city. Healthcare, of course, it's very well known for, but it's got a lot of other stuff going on too. So it, it's not your grandfather's Houston. Well, we cert we had a longer sample period, but in the when was the last one of these? Two thousand and fourteen or thirteen or fifteen? Yep. When, when oil prices dropped so precipitously, we really put on a full court um, oil market surveying uh, portfolio review that happened every week and every month. And we did see a bigger drop then. Of course, this over a longer period of time, we don't know what we've seen now over you know the big drop in March, April to the big spike. But um, there was a, not a notable change at all in the entry level lower prices. And there was a notable change uh, for at least six months to a year in the second, third move up in the higher end houses, which for those of you in California may know, uh, a higher end home in Houston is $500,000, um, not $2 million. <laughs> Um, so anyway, uh, th these are the comments that we've seen. Um, I, I would just say what the builders now, what are they saying? They're cautiously optimistic. They're happy. They're still keenly monitoring risk. Uh, a number of them say that active adult picked up notably in July and they're bullish because so many people stayed home even more so than the non-active adult in the normal spring selling market of March, April, and into May. The active adults were the latest. Now it's come back some in June, and, um, and that could be positive. Um, everybody is unhappy about lumber, and everybody knows that COVID is here. Uh, it's surging in many places, including many hotter markets, and they are not they're delighted with what they see, but they're not losing their minds and, and beginning to just flush the gas pedal again. Uh, this is a comment at the bottom from the CFO of a large private home builder, uh, heavily concentrated in the, in the Southeast entry level. And, and this guy's a 20, 25 year vet, says it's the best market he's ever seen. Not relative, he doesn't have a relative around that or anything, he just said, no, this is the best market I've ever seen. So what are they doing? What were they doing? Um, this is sort of our timeline. So the first thing that everybody did is think about operating in safety. The second thing they did is protect the backlog that they had from that robust January and February. And the next thing they did is figure out how to build houses and get inspections and get appraisals and get people to look at houses virtually and so forth. Um, and the next thing or simultaneous thing they were doing, like we all were doing, was making sure we had enough capacity in our networks and our, uh, our, our hardware and our software was, was going to function effectively. Um, and it did. It's remarkable. And I'm not just talking about the large national home builders. It's re the technology that people have deployed into small and medium middle market home building is quite impressive. Um, so that was sort of the first phase. You get in the next phase, people start making some defensive draws, uh, and then they start paying those back in May and June. Uh, everybody from the get-go was stress testing uh, and testing for impairments. They all turned off their land spend for 
four, five, six weeks and slowed down their development spin. Same with the specs. Uh, and then there were a handful of businesses that publicly announced uh, some layoffs and some cuts um, and some others that did not announce it, but we know that did it. Uh, once the Fed stepped in and the bond market stabilized, we did see some of the public builders issue long-term debt. Uh, some of it was to repay the defensive draws. Some of it was just to take advantage of an attractive market and refinance um, debt coming due down the road. Um, and now they're looking at just generating enormous amounts of cash. Margins are strong in home building when you turn down CapEx, which is land spend and, and spec spend, uh, and close out backlog, you, you generate liquidity. Um, so why in the world is this going on? Here's the take that we've gotten from our customers. Uh, and, and, we, and, the, and, and, and the conversations we have in credit meetings and portfolio meetings once a week that I'm engaged in, which is, wait a minute, this is great, we're delighted, but why in the world, housing's tied to jobs. Jobs are getting crushed. How, 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 what, how, what, what the hell is sort of what we're questioning. And I think the builders are saying the same thing. So in no particular order, these are the things that we can hear over and over when we ask that question of builders. We've got extraordinarily low mortgage rates. They're 100, 150 basis points lower than they were six months ago. There's lower competition. Resales are down, and now spec inventory on new homes is down. Um, that's good for margins, and that's good for new home sales when resales are down. Um, there is some pent-up demand, we're sure, and probably some pull forward. Um, a, a, the the mid-April, I mean, mid-March to mid-April, when I told you it really dropped precipitously, is one of the stronger four or five week periods uh, of a spring sales market every year. And it was not. And we think that, and builders think that a lot of that came back in June, May and June, on top of what would have already been there in May and June. Uh, people want to get out on apartments or urban density. I mentioned that earlier. People, this is notable, people believe, consumers believe that their employer is going to let them work from home either all the time or quite often going forward. And so the daunting commute that prevented them from moving to the exurbs is less of an, a, an impediment now. And so they're making the plunge. Uh, if you have to spend all day in your house, let's have it be a new house that's nice versus an older house or an older apartment. Um, by the way, we did hear also a lot of the, you know, a lot of the younger millennials or mid-age millennials that, you know, are, are in a nice apartment with cool amenities are also buying out in the burbs because they can't use the amenities and it's crowded uh, and uncomfortable if they do. Um, and then you've got sort of the, all the above together gets anybody that's on the fence to act. Uh, the little comment in the red box at the bottom is, um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense, but we're exact. This is sort of the, we list all these reasons on the left, but still there's 15% employment. Still there's a good crisis. The picture above is down in Florida for one of our clients, Mento communities with, you know, the, uh, the active adult buyers back, back in action. Um, so Last couple of slides, just I, I wouldn't know builders came into 2020 in really good position. Uh, there was a bad last quarter of 2018. And builders have, we, every builder conference you go to, the question is, how long is this cycle going to be? Are we in the eighth, ninth, or extra innings? Are we in the, I mean, it's no one's saying we're in the first or second. So I think builders hear that and they're smart. And again, these are survivors of the Great Recession. They sort of came into the this year lower leveraged and shorter land, and that's a safer place. Um, they also had very strong margins in their backlog. And, and as we've been saying, they've been sort of feathering the gas people through this pretty strong housing market leading into COVID instead of flooring it, perhaps because of the time that it's been in recovery and perhaps because they really did get a scare with a pretty rough fourth quarter of 18. Um, their mood, I've covered this a bit, they're happy. They're, I, I would note 
one of the things we hear so often, and I love our clients, is because they say things like this. They're very proud of how their team has performed and their resilience and their adaptability and their coping. And they're very, very proud of the technology platform that they had or quickly, quickly um, put sandbags around, um, really held up nicely. Nobody thinks this is sort of long-term sustainable at this rate. Maybe it may be a fine housing market, but it's not going to be great like it is right now with an unemployment place like this. But they also know there's just not a lot of inventory down here. So doomsday downsides are not so bad. And of course, they all know we're in a uh, coronavirus surge. Um, real quickly on banking, uh, um, I, I just put the little the little box in there. So this is what's this is this is just like a made up deal on a project loan with a LIBOR plus 300 spread. Uh, we have plenty higher and a few lower than that. Um, so if, if you looked at that, you know, in January, we were making nearly 5% revenue. And with the floors that, you know, maybe were more Wells Fargo and market customary of 20 basis points or so, um, you know, now LIBOR is down 90%. And so instead of making, I'm making closer to three than five. That's a 30% drop in revenue. And while our cost of funds is lower, our equity charges are not lower. Our fixed costs are not lower. Our long-term bond debt coupons are not lower. Um, and so, you know, that's bad. That's stressful on bank revenue. And so what are we doing with what we've got? Well, we're just trying to shore it up a bit with how we price and how we um, how we put LIBOR floors on it. Uh, different banks are pursuing that differently and we pursue it differently given different circumstances, but we tend to really uh, hone in on concentrating on a higher floor um, than 25 or 30 basis points, you know, two or three times that ideally. Um, and then we're also now, this is largely gone, the last bullet, but there was this sort of paradox where banks, when, when all the, particularly the money center banks, had big corporate clients drawing down lines of credit and stacking cash on the balance sheet, it actually caused some funny stresses on some of the ratios that we run, arguably when you were in a better liquidity and financial condition than ever. That's sort of, we could take that off, that's sort of gone away, uh, but that was an anomaly in sort of the credit thing. In terms of what we're doing in housing and home building, um, we're just sort of putting an extra lens on everything that we do. I think we, think, we think we're thoughtful underwriters anyway, um, but we're putting an extra lens on it and just harder sensitivity testing. And, you know, when we were closing things in May, we were saying only comp it against, you know, the last six or eight week sales, not pre-COVID sales. And now we may say, we'll, we'll strike out June. That was too high. It messes everything up <laughs> just to be more conservative. We have been monitoring the portfolio and doing weekly and monthly customer checks and sort of formalizing that. Last page. Um, I don't know um, what's temporary or what's shorter term. Uh, it may be for a while we'll have low rates. It won't be forever. It may be a while that resale inventory is down. It won't be forever. Um, I, I don't think the pent up demand of four or five weeks uh, with 57% with, with growth in June, that's certainly not gonna stay around. Same with the demand pull forward. Um, what do I think's here, you know, where our builders think is here? I think, I think customers believe that going forward, working from home is going to be a real option more often. Maybe not all the time. Office is not going to go away and team building and culture building is not going to go away. But working from home is going to be more frequently accepted. And thus, it's going to be less critical to live. You can live out in the country. You can live with a farther commute. Um, but the desire sort of in a rush to just get out of a crowded apartment, like, I have to right now. If we get COVID cleared or we or, or diminishes or there's some sort of vaccine, maybe it's hip again to be 
where the pretty restaurants are and the and the cool burger joints and the brew pubs. Um, and so this, those are sort of the same two points. Um, many of you have young young children in their college years, or I say that's young now, uh, or um, your friends have kids in college, and we get lots of questions about working at Wells Fargo, uh, about commercial real estate, about job opportunities, about being an investment banker somewhere or whatever. Uh, so, so we really do have a robust uh, information there. So let me know if, if that's not helpful. That's it, Richard. Uh, thank you very much, Bert. That was terrific. Uh, very clear and um, thoughtful. And I appreciate your breaking down what's more certain and what's less certain. Uh, before I turn it over to the audience questions, I have a couple from uh, of my own. So I, it strikes me that one of the reasons we don't have a big amount of competition out there for houses for sale is because of forbearance. So people who've lost their jobs um, don't have to sell their house tomorrow. Uh, and numbers I'm seeing is that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 7% of Fannie Freddie mortgages right now. Uh, how are you thinking about that? Is that going to go away? And, and, and let me add that. And then the other thing, of course, is right now we all the stimulus money is going away at the end of July. Now, it's looking more and more likely we're going to get something, but I don't know what that thing is. So, so those elements that have sort of kept things moving okay, how much are you thinking about those? How much are you worried about those things? I, well, I, I want to caveat first of all, I'm not speaking on behalf of inside info about the Wells Fargo mortgage book, which is the largest one, I believe. Um, that's right. In the country. So I, I, I don't have inside, you know, info that says we're going to do in this or seeing this or there'll be a, that'll never come or there'll be a wave of it. I, I don't have any of that. But in terms of what we're thinking of, um, we're just sort of getting to those things. I think, right, the, the first, in like all those lists of what we're builders doing and what we're banks doing, the first you're just in um, uh, battle mode of, ready to go and making sure that our teammates were safe and that we could get draws done and our back offices and wire rooms were functioning with wire professionals working from home and so forth. Um, and so we've gone through many of the same progressions I was describing to the builders. And right now our pipeline is not real flush with new loan requests for people anxious to take a big deal down in September or October. So the, the application of those sorts of disciplines for a new credit request would be where it would first hit. And then the second is, you know, in our second and third quarter overall portfolio reviews. So yeah, we're laying on, add that to the list, you know, um, co competition from secondary mortgage foreclosures or people that are not foreclosed but wanna sell so that that doesn't happen. Uh, we will lay on that. We just know that inventories are very light now. And even if that comes in, it probably could absorb it. And new home inventory, which is really the only thing we can control, is also very low. Uh, that's at one or two months supply. So, um, and not many builders are really long land. And so I feel okay there, but we will get into that analysis uh, right now. Okay. Well, along those lines, question from Nicole Smith. Um, is it just harder to buy a house now, a new house or an existing house, because of more stringent lending requirements? And that's, to some extent, undoing the benefit of the lower interest rates. It's not apparent that it was in June. It was up 57% June over June by our sample, and it was up 54% or 55% in Burns' sample. Uh, and we'll see the public re builders reporting, you know, uh, starting in 30 days or so. So it, it, the, the, those facts would suggest that it's not. Anecdotally, I heard it was brutal and frustrating um, in, you know, mid-March uh, when the 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 30 year mortgage, which has like a forever history of being sort of in a 160 to 200 spread band over the 10 year was suddenly at twice that or two and yep. a half times that. Yeah. 
and, and people just in despair with this 10 year at 60 or 70 or 80 basis points, why in the world is, is my mortgage company quoting four and a half or 5%? And I think that was a couple of reasons. The Fed hadn't stepped in yet. There was a risk premium being added and a whole lot of mortgage pipelines were stuffed full from a very busy sales period that I already talked about in January, February and a very active refinance period. So it was just sort of pricing to discourage demand almost. The Fed stepping in was the biggest part and you saw that spin downward. In terms of underwriting overlays, I think there are some as it relates to extra effort to make sure these people are not gonna miss their first payment because that's where the underwriter originator really gets the immediate put back with no debate. So uh, we have a question, by the way, for people who have questions of Bert, please type them into the Q&A box. Um, from Stanley Kafka, what do you see, you mentioned lumber, but more generically, what are you seeing uh, in the world of construction costs and the cost of finished lots? Um, well, it's, it's, we went, to see things validated for us, we see it in margin, in net margin in particular, to see uh, actual global, you know, sort of macro impact, it take, we won't see it till December or September when we, you know, when closings from yesterday and today and, and May are settling out in September, October, November. So that's when we see sort of margin performance. So everything I tell you again is anecdotally not what we're seeing our builders margins actually do. Uh, universally, we hear lumber is scaring them. And universally, we hear the labor's okay and the other supplies are okay. Here and there, there is exceptions. Appliances, um, lighting uh, in particular, um, supply chains to China, supply chains to things manufactured in Michigan or Seattle or a, you know, a, a closed state that was everything was closed for so long. Um, but that seems to be loosening up a bit. It seems to be that they're the same flat um, with those few exceptions. So let me ask you, and forgive the, I'm going to ask the audiences, forgive us to have a really nerdy question, but when you're computing your um, equity capital charges, can you tell us a little bit about how you do that, how you determine what that cost is? Because you were saying this is one of the reasons that, you know, that the cost of lending is not going to fall uh, the way the, uh, like, LIBOR has fallen. Yeah, we can't afford, uh, LIBOR has fallen 90%. We, we can't, yeah. we can't fall 90%, but we've fallen 30%. So, so it's, that, that, that's the, the common argument um, uh, I have made in our negotiations when, when we've been trying to get either more spread or more floor, which is if this deal worked for you in February or in January at 4.8% or 5.1%, and I'm going to increase this or increase that, and the result is it's 4%, you're still a winner. You're, you're a winner by 20%. You're a 100 basis point winner or 50 basis point or 110 basis point winner. So, um, so that, that, that's the, the driver on the revenue side. On the cost of capital side, we have robust models that update our pricer, which is how we calculate our, our ROEs, which is what we do when we're pricing loans. And then we up, you know, and that literally changes week to week. And it's based on models from our treasurer's department. And so equity capital charges, I can't tell you I fully understand other than there's a reserve premium, there's a risk premium, there's a sort of scarcity premium, um, and they've definitely come down over the last several weeks. Okay, all right. Because but, but, you said but that it, it's not, you know, it was, it was hard to get something to hit a bar six weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really hard to get something to hit a return hurdle six weeks ago. Now it's still higher than it was in terms of spread or and or floor, but not in the all-in range. Um, from James Torres, a question. Um, are developers bullish on new projects that will be completed, for example, by 2022? So I think what, what James tried to get at is, are people thinking about post-COVID world? Um, well, builders, uh, 
and you've had great ones as, as guests. Um, builders are constantly uh, walking a line and that line is growth. That line is being an entrepreneur and that line it is, is keeping a future pipeline so that they have a construction and development business. Um, and so they are absolutely in the market looking at deals for 2022 uh, and, and keeping those on the table. I don't know how many people are trying to tie up more lots on a lot takedown in Dallas or Houston or Atlanta or Phoenix uh, for the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year. I think they're probably saying what I've got's good. I'm actually talking to the developer about the contingency plan for me to extend that out. So you, you, we've talked about the cost of debt. One, one of the things you didn't mention, or if you did, I might have missed it, which I do from time to time. Uh, underwriting standards, are they, so are, are loan to cost changing dramatically or stayed more or less steady, for example? Um, it, well, you know, again, I, I'm part of a humongous commercial real estate ecosystem that includes uh, Fannie, Freddie, Agency Finance, CMBS, Multifamily Capital, Hospitality Finance, REIT Finance, Senior Housing Finance, Retail, I mean, there, there's everything. So I'm speaking today as home builder finance and, and development finance. Um, and I would say the only, no, we have not said what we used to do at 75, we'll do at 65, and what we used to do at 65, we'll do at 55. We've not come out with any new policies or grids as it relates to proceeds. Um, what we have said is what we would have done in January or February structurally is probably not precisely what we ought to do today in light of 15% unemployment and a COVID crisis and you know a, a very uncertain outlook, particularly sort of short and medium term. I, to me, it's this six, nine months. I'm, I, I don't. I don't think there's going to be doomsday for our business, for our customers. But it's, I have no idea what's going to happen in the global overall economy. And so we would just say, well, this looks precisely like the same term sheet you gave this customers for a similar deal in February. Shouldn't it be a bit more conservative? And so we might say, yeah, probably should. And so whether that manifested itself in a higher liquidity requirement or a little bit lower proceeds or a little bit higher uh, uh, pre-sale versus spec component or whatever it may be. We, we probably have some overlay on there. I did mention that one of the things. There's, there's probably an overlay or two on most, on most structurings. But um, right now the portfolio remains in remarkable shape. The, the number of downgrades we've done in this session is minute, uh, particularly compared to uh, many other segments in the bank. So it, it it makes me wonder about the influence of the regulatory regime on what you've been doing the last several years. So one of the things about Basel is it puts a very heavy risk weight on new construction lending. Um, did that, do you think that's influenced how you've done underwriting? So this is going back, of course, what, four or five years now. Um, do you expect those rules to change any time? Do you think those rules are sensible or are they actually helpful or somewhere in between? Um, my official answer is I don't know. I mean, caveat, caveat that. I do not know. What do I think? I'm not quite sure. Um, across the commercial real estate spectrums, across the banking system, th there was a lot of aggressive lending uh, pre pre Great Recession, and a lot of it for many banks was higher leveraged, with uh, sort of this thought. Well, it's okay that I've higher leverage because I've got recourse if for a secondary repayment source. Um, in commercial real estate, uh, not so not as much in housing, but in commercial real estate, there was a real pivot to less recourse and more upfront equity. So so there was that sort of was. I think that went in tandem with Basel and the um, 
the extra capital charges for uh, for construction and land lending. Um, I think they were both motivated by the exact same thing. The bank had a very difficult time in those asset classes, and the, the oversight said, y'all had a very difficult time in those asset classes. And so I think it was a bit simultaneously. So yeah, I think I think the, the if you just look at proceeds or loan to values or loan to costs in, in any in any of the commercial real estate classes, they're by and larger lower. Um, um, and so that's good from, from a loss perspective. It's harder to get, if you're a developer, to get returns on your equity, but the risk profile of your asset is is probably lower as well. So I I, I want to come back to your comments about, and, and by the way, if you have questions for Bird, please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, I found your comment interesting about how the higher end stuff is not doing as well as uh, stuff uh, further down the price spectrum. And you were very specific, Houston high end is half a million. If you could talk a little bit about what high end is in other parts of the country and what do you suspect, and I, I understand again, uh, I'm not holding you to uh, rigorous data analysis on this, but what do you suspect you're seeing more strength in the less expensive part of the market vis-a-vis -vis the more expensive part of the market? Well, I think a handful of reasons. One, I think it's always stronger. Uh, it just It's just almost always stronger. Uh, I hadn't been in real estate and banking very long when I learned about the housing pyramid. And you know, the, the top of it is the $2 million houses or in the bottom is the $200,000 houses. And there's just infinitely more people that can buy the two hundred or $300,000 house. And that's when rates were eight or 9%, by the way, when I was learning that or 11 when I first started. Um, so I, I think it's always been that way. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not a good move up housing market. I think it is considerably better in June than it was early. But I think maybe why it hasn't been as good is um, uh, me. I'm 57 years old. I'm an empty nester. I live in a house way too big for my wife and I, but I love where it is. Um, and while we have periodically talked a lot about a smaller house, a cooler one, a town home, uh, you know, a newer one. Um, we're not going to list. We weren't going to list our house in April, <laughs> and, you know, and and try to find one because rates are low. Uh, there were a lot of reasons why people were saying that that had been a bit before COVID. Why it had it been a little slower versus the entry? One of them was uh, I refinanced my mortgage two years ago, and and when rates went up relative to that. I don't want to trade out of this mortgage for a higher mortgage while I'm also actually buying a more expensive house because it's new. And even though it's smaller, it's newer and it's closer in and it's got more stuff. And so I don't really want to borrow money. Um, I think that's been a couple of reasons, but I think the, the first one is just, it's always stronger. The second one is uh, most builders in any place are trying to find a way to do it a little more affordably because they know it attracts more buyers. And the last is um, less critical now, but coming out of the recession in 2011, 12, 13, the first mover was absolutely the move up and the second move up. And there were still pretty heavy mortgage overlays in the mortgage entry level market and with FHA and so forth. Uh, and fewer programs for those buyers uh, and less confidence from those buyers. Um, that began to swing probably 2015, 16, if not before, to where the, the outperformance of the move up and second move up began to shift into a little bit outperformance by the entry level and the first time. So I'm going to, a question from John Loper, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to. Uh, embellish it a little bit. His, his question is just, do you, are there any trends you see in California home building markets that are different from the Southeast to the overall national market? And you talked a little bit about places that were shut down versus not. But the other thing I'm wondering about is, well, nationally foreign borrower, excuse me, foreign buyers are not particularly important. In Cal there are places in California where they really are. And I've heard anecdotes that specifically the Chinese just aren't in the market anymore. So any thoughts you have about that? 
Or did yeah, they handful, a um, handful. Yeah. Uh, Orange County had a pretty good June, uh, and it was, and, and everything in Orange County is pretty expensive, uh, and it seemed to have a pretty good June, and it was definitely slower out of the gate. Um, uh, and it had a decent May, but it had a very strong June from, from our, our channel checks there. Um, Sacramento, Central Valley, uh, Tracy, Manteca, uh, Eastern uh, Inland Empire uh, are doing very well. Uh, and that's semi-consistent with other larger sub-markets and markets. I think it's exaggerated because particularly in Northern California and into the Central Northern California like Sacramento and Tracy, that's really where you see Bay Area people, our builders are saying Bay Area, immediate Bay Area, tech workers or other related workers that worked from home one day a week or never uh, are now working from home five days a week and they're quite confident that they can do that for a while. Uh, and when it goes back to normal, normal baby two days a week and they can endure that brutally long commute twice a week but not five days a week. So those markets are really seeing that belief from the work from home. Um, so I would say that would be a trend that would, you know, be less so in Atlanta or less so in Houston. Um, um, I guess that, that's what I'd, I'd limit it to that. Um, in terms of the foreign buyer, I don't know. I, I doubt that OC was back because a whole lot of Asian buyers suddenly jumped back in in one month. But it, but it, it did have a much better month, month and a half. Oh. Well, uh, Bert Anderson, thank you for spending an hour of your day with us. That was really um, helpful. Uh, I'm sure our group really appreciates you taking the time. Again, Bert Anderson, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, guys. Appreciate the opportunity. Have a great rest of your week. Okay. Take care.